So you feel it's finally time to lose some weight. I'm Ryan Adams from naturalweightlossmastery.com and in this video I'd like to lay out my 30 day plant based weight loss challenge so you can maximize your results over these next 30 days with this amazing approach to nutrition. I'm going to give you everything you need to know to get started right now in bite sized actionable steps. Let's dive in. So some key rules here before we dive into the plan. Number one is simplicity. Listen, maybe you're new to veganism, new to plant-based eating, or simply new to the health and weight loss aspect of it. Either way, I'm assuming here that you're a beginner or intermediate at some stage. This sounds condescending, but you absolutely must. It's imperative that you take these very actionable baby steps, quote unquote. Why? Because many new plant-based dieters do indeed make the mistake of getting very confused, making it too overwhelming, rushing to the grocery store, thinking they need a list of 50 ingredients, getting back, and rightly being extremely excited about this new approach to nutrition that they're adopting, but looking in their recipe book, making some very elaborate and time-consuming meal, which, yeah, tastes delicious. Okay, days one and two might be wonderful, but you hit days three and four with that sort of approach. Are you really going to be able to stay on track when you're spending two hours in the kitchen every day, when you think you need all of these things, when you're thinking about every food group and every nutrient in every meal, trying to come at it from this Puritan perspective? So whilst it's easy for me in this video, to lay out a list, a blueprint based on the perfect plant-based textbook, if you will, with every nuance and semantic of nutrition. I don't think that's necessarily practical for those beginners and intermediates out there. So we need to make things very simple. If I could take that theme and plug it in your head for the rest of this video, I'd be very, very happy. So please apply that. Listen, number two here, health as well as weight loss. This is a big one. Anyone can lose weight. Anyone can take any diet out there and believe it or not, if it's Pop-Tarts or Twinkies, you can lose weight. If it's carnivore or keto, you can indeed lose weight through this method of calorie restriction. It's a popular method. Is that healthy? Is that sustainable? Of course not. It's very likely that if you're attracted to this video, you also have you've also got excuse me health motivations as well as the weight loss. But let's actually practice that, okay? Let's not judge our progress solely on the numbers on the scales. Let's also care about our health and well-being, our longevity, our vitality at the same time. That's a key component of everything I teach here. And likely because I know my audience fairly well at this stage, that resonates with you as well. This is also going to quite obviously be a nutrition-centered approach. That's not just because the title has in it plant-based. But that's also because that is what matters most when it comes to weight loss. Uh, the likes of exercise, rest, uh, sleep, stress management. These are all undeniably key determinants of weight loss. But do they rank as importantly as nutrition? Absolutely not in my experience and according to the general health and scientific consensus on this. That's not a contentious statement at all. Most people think that weight loss is around 50% nutrition, 50% exercise. Absolutely not in my experience. It is much more about the nutrition. So this largely, we are gonna cover exercise a little bit later on here, but this is largely going to be centered on good nutrition. And listen, final rule here, no going hungry. Most people, the, the idea of weight loss is synonymous with uh, restriction, is synonymous with this extreme chore where they're going hungry, they're limiting their favorite foods. Listen, there's going to be an element of struggle during this 30 days for you, I'm sure of that. It's going to uh, incur a little bit of suffering in your life. It's going to be hard work. I'm never going to say it'll be plain sailing, but you make it a great deal more effortless when you truly feel full and satisfied with your meals. Plant-based eating can be so wonderful from this perspective because of the low calorie density, the high fiber content, all the nutrients we're taking in with a decent balanced plant-based approach. It's so easy to stay full and satisfied and still lose weight at the same time with this methodology. By going hungry, you risk throwing in the towel altogether. You risk, you risk actually, yeah, you can lose weight, but you risk maybe losing weight too rapidly. It's unsustainable. So we want to feel full and satisfied. That's a key component here. So when it comes to getting started, a couple of points of note before we dive in. Number one, and I've hinted at this already, there is a balance here to strike, for you to strike between what's optimal and what you can actually adhere to. I factored this into this plan, to this challenge to some degree, but you also need to take a look at your own life, your own schedule, your own taste preferences, and you need to do this for yourself. That's something I can't help you with in this video. You need a balance between, as I say, what's optimal, what is quote unquote, perfect for weight loss and what you can actually stick to. Think of this as a seesaw. You don't want to go too far either way. If you go too far, 
just picking the foods you enjoy and what you want to do, you might well be sacrificing what is best for maximum weight loss. By going too far with maximum weight loss, you might be following a strategy that isn't that sustainable. So we want to strike a great balance, that's key. Uh, in a similar vein, consistency over pe perfection is a mantra I've shared a great many times on this channel. It's almost a Ryan Adams cliche at this stage. It is so important. As I've said here, we're not necessarily focused on being as puritan as possible all the time. It's more about what we can stick to day to day. What sort of healthy diet, healthy exercise regime can we actually stick to day to day? Uh, day to day, excuse me. What is the danger of being too perfect? It's unsustainable. It can be unmanageable. It can be highly impractical in 2020 now to be absolutely perfect with your nutrition, to control everything going into your food all of the time. It most certainly can be. Um, finally here, you absolutely must, I implore you, this video is a wonderful place to start if I don't say so myself, but I implore you, you must learn as you go. A lot of people think they must learn before they take action, huge mistake. A lot of people think they don't need to learn anything and they can learn in time, also a huge mistake. You've got to learn a little bit now and I hope you find this video valuable as a starting point. Yet at the same time, you absolutely must educate yourself periodically as you go here. We've got the internet nowadays, makes for wonderful resources to go out and get access to to the information we need on plant-based nutrition, all sorts of wonderful channels. Uh, if you're not subscribed to this one, hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell down below so you can stay updated on all the information I'm putting out there. But uh, in other words, read the books, get the programs you need to help you stay on track, to learn as you go, get the information you need. This is just a blueprint to get started, as I say, but you're still going to have to educate yourself as you go. No need to do it all at once, no need to do it all before you get started. As I say, that can be bewildering. But on the flip side, don't do any at all. Don't do no information grabbing whatsoever. You have to educate yourself as you go, but you can do it as you go here. Food shopping, this is where it starts to get pretty daunting for people. They can get motivated, they can get excited. They start walking through the grocery store. They get confused about nutrition labels and whatnot. So here I want to share with you, I want to break it down, make it very rudimentary but applicable for you. I'm going to give you here six basic staples. So number one, first thing that needs to go in your grocery cart here, grains. So whole grains, so the likes of brown rice, uh, bulgur wheats, oats, uh, whole wheat pasta, quinoa, whole wheat couscous, barley, and so on. Okay, grains number one. Potatoes, like sweet potatoes, white potatoes. You can also lump yams in this group if you're a fan. I personally like the large ones for baking, really delicious. You can chop potatoes up and do some nice oil-free, healthy, weight loss encouraging uh, wedges in the oven there. Do nice potato and veggie stews and whatnot, but potatoes, wonderful staple from a weight loss perspective. Number three are legumes, so that incorporates the likes of the beans, the split peas, and the lentils. So we're thinking kidney beans, chickpeas, lentils, they're my favorite. I also love black beans, whatever you prefer. You can do some amazing rice and beans dishes. Quite versatile are legumes. You can do a reasonable amount with them, but nice rice and beans dishes. Uh, lentil dal I had a couple of days ago, that was delicious. Various things you can do there. Uh, number four then, fruit. Fruit, incredible from a weight loss perspective. Very low calorie density, or they tend to have a very low calorie density there. There are, of course, some exceptions, such as the dried fruit, but they tend to have a low calorie density, high water content, so very hydrating, lots of important uh, excuse me, antioxidants, phytochemicals, nutrients, vitamins, minerals, and so on, fiber as well in fruit. So what can you do with fruit? Listen, you can do your, you can throw it on your breakfast oats, you can do the smoothies, you can snack on them, you can chop up an apple and throw that in your salad and your green leafy greens. Amazing, all sorts you can do with fruit, great snack, and also in many cases can make for a great meal too. Vegetables, similar nutrition profile to fruit there. I like courgettes, red pepper, I like sweet corn, kale, onion. Those dark leafy greens primarily are amazing. So the kale, uh, the spinach and so on, the collard greens, amazing from a health perspective. So much good nutrition there. And again, from a weight loss standpoint, very low calorie density in most, the vast majority of vegetables. So from a weight loss perspective, it's great to get lots of fruits, lots of veggies on your plate so you can fill up the volume without actually consuming that many calories. Very powerful indeed. And finally here, Number six then are healthy fats, so almonds, hazelnuts, chia seeds, sunflower seeds, and avocados. So nuts and seeds, of course, primarily. Then, of course, we think of our soy derivatives, soybeans. They do go in the legume group, of course, but they are quite high in fat content versus lots of other beans and lentils and whatnot. So the likes of tofu and tempeh and soy derivatives, soy milk as well, they're a little bit higher in fat, so they do contribute to our fat intake, so more so than a lot of other plant foods, let's say. Uh, 
uh, coconut is one that can go in this group as well. So these healthy fats, having some of these in our daily diet, very, very important, full of great nutrition. We'll cover that more shortly. So they're the six basic staples. So you might be thinking, Ryan, that's extremely simplistic. What about this? What about this? What about this? Listen, you can learn as you go, which is a point I'm about to share. You can learn as you, oh, I've already shared rather, but you can learn as you go. You can experiment in time. You can make your meals exciting in time. For right now though, we want to simplify so you can actually stick to this. So you can start forming these new habits without making it too complicated for yourself. That's key. So these six basic staples of grains, potatoes, legumes, fruits, veggies, and healthy fats, good place to get started. A couple of additional extras there that need mentioning, of course, the herbs, the spices, the condiments, uh, seasonings, sauces, and so on, dressings. These are things you've likely already got a hold of, but these are things you can throw in your basket as well. Things like nutritional yeast and so on, things like ketchup, barbecue sauce, uh, salt, pepper, and various herbs and spices and whatnot. So in time, as I mentioned, you can expand your options, but for now, it really is smart. It really does pay to stick to four or five basic meal ideas. Not every meal, of course, has to be extremely repetitive, has to be exactly the same. That can be monotonous in time. So what you can do is have four or five rough ideas. So, okay, for lunches, I'm gonna have my rice and beans and a veggies dish, uh, but I'm gonna switch what those are. So sometimes it's gonna be brown rice, sometimes it's gonna be red rice, sometimes it's gonna be kidney beans or chicken peas another day. Sometimes it's going to be courgette that I have that with zucchini. Sometimes it's going to be a mix of red peppers and mushrooms and so on. So yeah, have these four or five basic staples in your mind for your meals. Stick to those for now. By extending that list, if you're a beginner to eight or 10, you're really, really going to be pushing the boat out there. You're going to set the boundary very, very high. It's going to complica complicate, excuse me, not only your first few imperative uh, grocery shopping trips, but also your kitchen stuff. Also what you're doing in the kitchen, okay? Big question then, this is one I get asked a lot, to calorie count or not to calorie count, okay? This is huge. So, listen, it's not necessary for many is the first point to note, especially at first. If you're a beginner or intermediate when it comes to weight loss, it's very likely that when you adopt this plant-based approach, I don't think it's the same for other diets, but when you adopt this plant-based approach, you don't actually need to count calories to see wonderful results. Why? A couple of main reasons, but largely because these plant-based foods tend to have such a low calorie density versus a lot of the foods in, of course, the standard westernized diet or even other uh, so-called weight loss diets and other diets and whatnot. But um, yeah, the low calorie density there means that they yield lots of volume. Plant foods tend at least to yield lots of volume for very few calories. So you can fill yourself up, you can satisfy yourself, you can eat fairly generous portions at times while still losing weight at the same time, while still staying in this calorie deficit. So for many people, it's absolutely not necessary. And I can proudly say that I haven't had to count a calorie in four and a half years now since going plant-based, since going vegan in the summer of 2015. And that was a huge relief after 18 months or so of calorie counting. So with limited results, I should stress as well. So really wonderful. You don't necessarily have to count calories. There are also, in my mind, a couple of downsides to counting calories, uh, such as the sort of behavior that encourages. A lot of people then adopt uh, this flexible dieting sort of approach, which I argue isn't optimal from a health standpoint or isn't in many cases anywhere near optimal from a health standpoint. Um, also, it's kind of neurotic. It's, it's a bit of a chore and it sort of drives people insane. And to have a very, very bad, sorry, I shouldn't say such blunt a statement as it drives people insane. It can do. Uh, it certainly did me at times and I am, I am exaggerating slightly there. But, you know, it, you know, it, it is neurotic. It can uh, lead people to developing a very poor relationship with food where they're completely, uh, completely uber focused on every little gram of food they're eating, worrying about every little bite they have uh, and whether that's going to lead to weight loss or weight gain and so on. So that's not really a, a mentally healthy way of operating when it comes to long-term health and weight management, I would argue. And I don't think that's a contentious statement at all there. So yeah, listen, it can take you down a bad path and also it's not necessary. That's the first point of note on this. So I've already mentioned plant foods tend to have very low calorie density. Having said that, having said that, from time to time, I do encounter people that are taking, quote unquote, lots of the right steps. They've taken on lots of my nutrition protocols here. They've maybe lost the first 20 pounds, but they're really struggling. They hit a plateau. That might be when it's worth turning your attention to your calorie intake, to tracking your calories with something like Chronometer or MyFitnessPal, seeing where you stand. Now, that doesn't mean you have to track and measure out every gram of food you eat every day, but simply to have this preliminary look, to do this little experiment for three or four days where you do track your calories to see where you stand, to see where you might be going wrong. I think it's a very smart move at that sort of stage um, where you've tried everything else, you've done a lot of other troubleshooting, let's say. 
So what I'm going to do on that basis is put links in the description box down below for some online calorie counters so you can start to see uh, where, and it is an estimate at the end of the day, but it's taking your measurements there, it's taking your data, and it's going to spit out a number for you there of the amount of calories that you, uh, your metabolic rate, your the amount of calorie burn. At a sedentary level, number one, that's going to be the first link, then the second one is going to tell you what your calorie, uh, your calorie expenditure looks like with activity levels factored in. So have a look at those two calculators if you're really interested in this. But generally speaking, uh, my stance is no, avoid calorie counting where possible, I would say. Sometimes it's necessary, but for most of you, uh, it certainly isn't going to be necessary right now. That's how amazing this approach to nutrition is. Or, or can be, I should say, when you take the right step. So, a couple of final points to note on the nutrition front before we get into the details of this. First of all, fat content. So plant fats can be very healthful, certainly far more healthful, I argue, uh, far more weight loss encouraging than fats from animal sources, but they can indeed slow weight loss. Why? Because a, ca uh, excuse me, a gram of fat yields nine calories, a gram of carbohydrates and protein only yields four calories. So that's actually less than half. So if you think of a fat rich meal versus a carb or protein rich meal, you're going to get a lot more calories, let's say, for the same volume of food, if that makes sense in your mind. I'm not sure if that's a clear image, a clear analogy. But in other words, volume wise, you're much better off focusing on the carbohydrates and the protein versus the fat. Still having some fat because we want to access those benefits of these healthy plant fats. They can be wonderful for the blood, for heart, um, for the heart, excuse me, for hair, for bones, for the brain, and so on. So these are really, uh, you know, healthy plant fats are really important for health, are really integral part, excuse me, of a healthy plant-based uh, plant based diet. Yet at the same time, they can indeed slow weight loss because of their high calorie density. So the likes of nuts and seeds and whatnot, wonderful health properties within them, but we have to be a little bit conscious of our fat content. Okay. Point number two here, processed foods, are they acceptable? Uh, generally speaking, no. We want to focus on these intact whole foods. However, not all processed foods are bad. Uh, you know, not all processed foods are made equal, which is a little bit of a cliche, but it's absolutely true. So there are some healthy, weight loss encouraging plant-based uh, foods that are processed, uh, that are technically processed, but still can be a decent part, let's say, of a weight loss encouraging diet. So the likes of whole wheat bread, gluten-free bread, even some types of sourdough and rye bread can be great for weight loss. Uh, cereal, you've got healthy cereal options like uh, bran flakes and shredded wheat, for example. Pasta, we can have our whole wheat pasta or maybe lentil pasta, bean pasta and so on. Polenta, things like this. Yeah, I, I mean, technically the likes of tofu and tempeh, they're processed as well, technically speaking. I know they're only fermented, but technically speaking, they're processed because they're taken out of their natural form. And so, yeah, we absolutely can have these uh, on a weight loss encouraging diet. We can have these and still lose weight in reasonable amounts. Now, there might be a point where if you plateau and you've tried lots of the other tactics that you need to look at your ratio of whole foods versus these intact, uh, these, excuse me, processed foods that are still fairly healthy. You might need to look at your proportions of those, your ratio of those. Uh, but for now, going forward as a beginner or intermediate here, yeah, feel free to have uh, some of these. We don't want to go crazy with them because they are still processed at the end of the day. By processing and refining a food, you are naturally going to strip away some of the fiber and the other important nutrients there. The calorie density is likely going to be larger as well. So we need to consider that. We do need to consider that. But generally speaking, yeah, you can have some of these things. Okay, I'm not talking about Pop-Tarts or potato chips or fizzy drinks, but generally speaking, these ha healthy processed foods you can have most certainly. So food to plate volume here, and it's key that I point out, I'm not actually talking about uh, calories here, but I'm talking about the volume of each type of the following kind of food groups and how that makes up your plate. So I think what's optimal for weight loss, generally speaking, just so you can get a clear picture of this in your mind, is to base your plate 60% starches, 30 to 35% fruits and veggies. I suppose that depends what sort of meal you're making. You're not gonna have veggies for a lunch or evening meal typically. And then five to 10% fats. So again, I must stress, this is not calories. This is not my calorie macronutrient breakdown or anything like that. But this is just so you guys can get a very visual picture. You can see in your mind's eye what a healthy weight loss encouraging plate should look like for the most part. Again, there are tweaks and adjustments to be made if your progress slows, if you hit a plateau. But to get started around 60% starches, 30 to 35% fruits and veggies, 5 to 10% fats. 
For example here, and we are going down the rabbit hole a bit with this, but I think it's a valuable example. One thing you can do if you're not losing weight is you can reduce the amount of starches there. You can take it, for example, down from 60% to maybe 50%, and then you can increase your fruits and veggies, the proportion of your plate that comes from those fruits and veggies. That will naturally lower the calorie density. Of course, it depends what starches and fruits and veggies you're taking. If it's dates we're talking about, then that might be an exception to the rule because they're extremely high in terms of calorie density. But generally speaking, if you increase your proportion of fruits and veggies, that plate is going to uh, lower, be reduced in terms of the number of calories there, that could be all it takes to instigate a little bit of weight loss. So we're still having the same volume of food with this method, that's why it's really smart, but we're cutting back ever so slightly on those starches. Now you might be thinking, hold on Ryan, I just want to lose weight, why do I need those starches at all? Surely, based on what you've just said there mate, I can increase my fruits and veggies, I don't need much of the starches, I could do maybe 20%. And my weight loss will be amazing. Well, the danger with that is you're having such low calories because those starches like the legumes, the potatoes, um, the whole grains like the oats and whatnot, the brown rice, they have bulk, they have calories, they have a higher calorie density than some of the aforementioned. And so you give yourself at least a decent amount of calories to thrive and survive while still losing weight at the same time. So we don't want our calorie deficit to be so large that it's completely unmanageable. So we need those starches in there. I can't stress that enough. And finally, important note four here, no oil. We don't want oil. Yes, oil can be found, uh, excuse me, is derived from typically a healthy plant food, sunflower, vegetables, coconut, and so on, but it's refined again and again and again. And in that process, we're stripping away lots of good nutrients there. Oil in itself can be a calorie bomb because it's just, as I say, stripped away of these nutrients, especially coconut oil, an absolute calorie bomb, okay? So just a little bit of the stuff can yield 100, 200 calories. So we don't want to use oil. If you're a big cooker when it comes to oil right now, if you're a big user of oil right now, you can start frying or sauteing your food in a splash of water in a non-stick frying pan. Sometimes you don't even, need, don't even need water, but a splash of water. You can use soy sauce, you can use vegetable broth, you can use applesauce. Of course, it depends what you're doing, but you can easily cook without oil. For some people, they're so traditional about oil that this is mind-blowing, but you absolutely can do it. Give it a shot. And in terms of, because um, a lot of people, they might throw some oil on there in their salad dressings and whatnot. What you can do instead is just season your food well in the first instance, okay? Just make some nice healthy dressings without the oil, nice herbs, spices, and seasonings. Make your food taste amazing so you don't need or miss the oil, okay? And if you're baking in the oven, just use lined baking paper. That's a big tip. So, this obviously begs the question for many people ask, for many people watching this, you'll be thinking this right now. Okay, Rye, how often should I be eating? The big question, four or five smaller meals per day, three large ones, should I do this intermittent fasting stuff? Should I not eat in the morning and so on? This is a huge question for many people. So how often should you eat? So again, just so I can give you some context on how I'm thinking when I answer this, in my mind, I'm thinking about your adherence, what's going to allow you to succeed and thrive with this plant-based methodology, lose weight over the long term, lose the weight and then keep it off, okay? That's what I'm thinking here. I'm not necessarily so much thinking about what is absolutely perfect, what's going to yield the most weight loss, and I'm not, of course, thinking about no weight loss whatsoever. We have to be objective here. I am results oriented with this stuff. Yet at the same time, we must strike this balance. We must find this adherence, okay? What you can actually stick to, what you can be consistent with, what is sustainable for you personally, okay? So when we're thinking how often should you eat, that's what you should be thinking in your mind. When you're, when you're listening to my advice on this right now, first and foremost, you should be thinking, okay, what can I stick to? What resonates with me? What clicks with my routine and so on? So it's more about eating right than it is about meal frequency. This is huge. It's more about eating the right sorts of foods than how often, how frequently you're eating. That's key number one, okay? So three important questions here to answer this question for yourself because I'm not going to do it for you here. Number one, what do you prefer, okay? What do you like doing, okay? Number two, what feels good for your body? Do you notice that when you're having two meals per day, two to three meals per day, and maybe a couple of snacks in between, you personally feel better in yourself than when you're having to eat more frequently? What feels best for your body? What feels best for your digestion? What feels, um, you know, is it a struggle to have that larger meal a couple of times per day? Does having the four or five uh, meals per day make it more manageable for you because you're not stuffing yourself? Do you feel a bit sluggish after you have to have a big meal because you've got all this bulky fibre plant food in your system, fibre rich plant food in your system, and therefore you need to sit down, you feel a bit tired, you feel a bit lethargic, then yeah, maybe four or five meals might be the way to go for you. 
what feels good for your body, really important to know. And finally here, and this is really key, it might even be the most important, would you believe, out of the three, what fits your schedule? I hinted at this a minute or two back. What fits your routine? What is preferable for you? Are you at work, school, or college, and therefore it's impractical to be, impra impractical, spit it out right, uh, to be eating constantly throughout the day when you're in the office at your desk? Is that impractical for you? Are you looking after the children? Um, yeah, think about your schedule, think about your routine, and this can differ uh, based on, you know, routine, based on profession and so on, uh, based on personal and professional commitments and whatnot, hobbies and interests. So this is very much, sadly, one of those things that's different for everyone, and that's why it's so hard for me to give um, blanket template advice on this. But listen, you've got to analyse these three questions, you've got to think about your answers and then select uh, a, mode of, um, a mode of eating that's right for you in terms of frequency. And one big final tip that I haven't listed here that I've just thought of actually, this is huge. It's probably a wise move to roughly speaking, stick to the frequency that you have right now. Even before going plant-based, before worrying about health and weight loss, it's probably best to stick to that because it's not too much of a change. We're already making quite a few changes in terms of what you're eating, in terms of the nutrition. So if you can just manage and keep the same, keep consistent with the things that you've already got nailed down, such as an eating routine, you know, certain habits, if you can combine these new good, healthy, uh, nutrition-focused habits with other habits that you've got right now, you're going to make it a lot easier for you. So if you were somebody in the past that's eating four or five meals per day, you go plant-based and you are thinking, okay, let's do the two to three meal thing, as Ryan might have suggested, Maybe that's not so practical for you. Maybe it'd be wiser to do the four or five thing for now because you're already in that routine. So that's smart as well. You're not necessarily upending all of your habits that you've built over the past few years and decades. So that's a good point to note too. So let's jump into the good stuff here, the meal ideas. So breakfast, lots of options, but they mainly center around the, the, these few kind of staples. So oatmeal, uh, potato hash mix, you can do a potato hash mix where you throw in, where you grate some potatoes, you fry them uh, in a nonstick frying pan, as I say, with some water, throw on some salt, some pepper, a bit of paprika might go nice as well, uh, maybe some veggies, some red pepper, some mushrooms, some onion and so on. Stir that up, fry it for, a, fry it for 10 to 15 minutes, it's going to be absolutely gorgeous. That's going to be amazing. Uh, maybe add some barbecue sauce or tomato ketchup as well. Uh, you can do smoothies. You can do fruit on its own as a fruit salad. Uh, sometimes, frankly, I wake up in the morning and I just have a big punnet of grapes and maybe a few apples on the side. Sounds really basic, but if I'm in a rush, that's so convenient. I don't have to prepare anything. Um, cereal, so healthy cereal options. I covered those already. We're going to top the shredded wheat or the muesli or the bran flakes uh, with some plant milk there, some unsweetened plant milk. Maybe we throw on a handful of mixed berries there, some blueberries. Uh, maybe I like to throw on some hemp seeds, some flax seeds, some chia there for those healthy fats. Really great healthy option there too. Uh, toast, so we can have whole wheat toast with maybe some jam, maybe some avocado again for those healthy fats that we're being a little bit conscious of, but we can have some of these. Brilliant. So there's all sorts you can... Sorry, I say there's all sorts you can do there. That's a contradiction with what I said earlier. Pretty basic staples there, but within that, you can create quite a lot of variety in terms of switching things up here and there. As I say in your oatmeal, you can change it up whether you have plant milk in there or water, whether you have berries, bananas, chia seed, flaxseed, and so on. Maybe a little bit of nut butter as well for something different. All sorts you can do there, okay? Lunch. Tofu stir fry is a great one, so taking a block of tofu or half a block of tofu, slicing it up, frying it for a couple of minutes in non -stick, in a non-stick frying pan, maybe with some onions, uh, maybe with some garlic as well, bit of seasoning there, bit of soy sauce, then throwing in, uh, you can get them quite handily now, uh, bags of uh, prepared mixed stir fry veggies, if not you can get your own bean sprouts and shredded cabbage, you can shred some cabbage, some red pepper, that sort of stuff, a bit of carrot there and whatnot. Throw that all together, stir it, and, and then throw the veggies in, I should say. Stir for another two, uh, cook on high for another two to three minutes. Voila, amazing bit of soy sauce. Delicious, delicious. Uh, that's perhaps uh, not so high in carbohydrates, so maybe for some of you, you want to add a little bit of brown rice to that. That might be great. Uh, or some rice noodles in a similar vein. Uh, mixed bean salad, so taking a can of mixed beans, chopping up some celery, dicing a tomato, an onion, uh, bringing that all together with a little bit of salsa. Amazing simple lunch that you can throw in a Tupperware container, take with you to work or school, throw it in the fridge, eat when you're ready. Uh, in a similar vein, you could do a green salad with loads of healthy mixed uh, green, mixed leafy greens. And then for some bulk, you need to throw on, you could throw on some beans, some quinoa, maybe a few cashew nuts. Pomegranate seeds sounds amazing right now. It's lunchtime here 
here in the UK at, at the time of me filming this. So I'm pretty game for that right now. That sounds pretty good. So dinner, you can do a rice and beans combination. You can do a Buddha bowl with maybe some oil-free hummus, a few veggies in there, amazing. You can do a healthy pasta. So you can do whole wheat or spelt pasta perhaps with a lentil marinara, that's what I really like to do, or maybe, maybe just a basic tomato sauce that you either prepare at your home from, prepare at home rather from uh, chopped tomatoes in a can, heat that up over the stove or hob, uh, maybe throw in some mixed, uh, mixed herbs there, mixed Italian herbs, some thyme, some oregano, some basil, bit of salt and pepper, that'd be amazing. Maybe throw a couple of veggies in there too. As I say, I like to do it with lentils, carrots, uh, eggplant, aubergine for my fellow Brits and so on. Really, really amazing. So healthy pasta options there. Uh, jacket potato you can do with some salsa, with some ketchup. That's one of my go-to classics. If you're an OG subscriber, you know that. Uh, what else? So you can do the potato wedges, as I mentioned. You can do a potato and veggie stew. All sorts you can do with potatoes. Potato is incredible for weight loss, by the way, guys. Amazing. So low in fat, really low calorie density, so you get all this volume for a few calories. Uh, white potatoes, in particular, rate very highly on the satiety index. So in terms of the fullness uh, that you get from a white potato, it's absolutely amazing. It's off the chart. So great for weight loss. So there's dinner, there's dinner. Snack-wise, it's the obvious stuff. It's fruit, it's toast with some jam, whole wheat toast with some jam or something like that. Uh, raw veggies, perhaps you slice up a bit of celery, a few carrots, a bit of red pepper, dip that in some oil-free hummus, amazing. Another option if you're feeling like you're snacking throughout the day, just make your meal portions for those main meals ever so slightly larger, big tip. Uh, so for more ideas, or for more specific ideas, because some of those admittedly are quite vague, some of you would prefer a little bit more instruction than that, so I hear you on that. You can get five free recipes in the blog section at naturalweightlossmastery.com. And actually, if I scroll down here, I can show you all of these notes because a lot of people, when I make this sort of screen share video, they're like, Ryan, I want all the notes. I don't want to type them out for myself. Head over to naturalweightlossmastery.com, hit the blog section. You'll see all of these notes there in uh, the blog post that will be titled the 30 day plant-based weight loss challenge. Um, so you'll see it all there and you'll also find those five free recipes as well. So there's breakfast, lunch, and a dinner recipe there and also a dressing and sauce recipe. So great place to get started in terms of recipes there if you're struggling. So they're the meal ideas. Hope you got a lot of value from that anyway and some things that you can get started with. There's so many great recipes online, so many great recipes in books and whatnot. So many uh, people don't even, most people, they don't even need to look at recipes. They've got a couple of ideas. They just need a bit of inspiration and they just need some confirmation on what is actually a decent weight loss encouraging sort of meal to eat anyway. Question that I get asked often, and I'm sure that many people will say in the comment section when they follow this 30 day weight loss challenge, Rai, how quickly can I expect these results? So I would say that we want to see a change in the scales by towards the end of week one at the start of week two. Now it's important not to be so neurotic about this, that we're like, why aren't the results coming? Why aren't the results coming? Jumping on the scales constantly. But certainly by the end of week one and two, if you're taking the right steps, and there are some caveats here, but if you're taking the right steps, you're going to notice a change. It might be a very small change at first, but you're going to notice a change in terms of the numbers on the scale. So that's our own subjective opinion aside because some people they'll look in a mirror and they'll think, oh, I've lost a little bit around the love handles here. Uh, my biceps are looking a little bit bigger from the uh, what I'm doing in the gym. I'm feeling a little bit more toned. I can feel the muscle in my legs better now, blah, blah, blah. A lot of people make these subjective, um, subjective uh, assessments, which there's a lot of downsides to making such assessments as you can imagine because the mind can play tricks and who are we to judge and that sort of thing. Uh, especially as a beginner, you know, you're not really in necessarily, a, uh, you don't really necessarily have the education, the knowledge on this to make a good assessment like that if you're a complete beginner. So we shouldn't be uh, subjectively checking ourselves out all the time. It's really good to have a measure of our progress, such as uh, the scale. So by the end of week one and week two here, it's pro that's probably about the sort of time where if you're not seeing results, you might wish to change something here. And I'm gonna share some troubleshooting tips at the end here, as you'll see. But certainly that's kind of the period of time where we can start to expect some see things, to see some things. Now, I'm not telling you that you're gonna lose 10 pounds in the first week or anything like that. Although I have had some crazy stories with my clients in the past, but certainly we want to see a little bit of a change on the scales in at that sort of time. So as I say here, one to two pounds per week, that's sort of the going rate that's put out there on the subject of weight loss. That's the that's the going rate for a successful strategy for beginners and intermediates. When you get to that advanced stage and you're looking at kind of really toning down, losing maybe the last five to 10 pounds or so, 
that's when it's naturally going to be a lot slower for you, probably. Again, there are asterisks and caveats there, but I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. Um, but one to two pounds a week, generally speaking, if you're a beginner or intermediate, that's probably a good rule of thumb. Now, this doesn't mean if you only lose 0.9 of a pound one week that you freak out and think you need to change everything. This is just a ballpark figure, but that is probably something that's smart to aim for if you're just getting started. But please note, there is this diminishing rate of returns with weight loss. So if you're already fairly well into your weight loss journey and you're watching this video for a bit more information on how to take things to the next level, that's probably not a good ballpark estimate for you. It should be lower. Uh, as I say, as I've highlighted here, this depends on several different factors. So, you know, such as where you are now, uh, your weight right now, your height, gender as well can make a big difference here. It can, it is typically harder for women to lose weight than men. That's a quite a, quite a, it's quite a binary statement for me to make and it's quite vague and I'm not going to go into the specific specifics of that but generally speaking that does seem to be the case according to the science and certainly my experience as a weight loss coach. In other words what I'm saying here is this depends on so many different factors such as weight, what your goals are, any underlying hormonal thyroid, thyroid issues they can make a small difference as well so there's all sorts of caveats to this but generally speaking good ballpark figure there. Listen, I just want to sing the praises of deploying some patience here. This is a 30-day challenge. It's not going to change your life and your weight loss destiny in this 30 days. It could be a great transition, a great turning point for you. But please don't expect to look like a supermodel in 30 days here. We must deploy some patience. So many people flake out of weight loss because they're needy. They're looking for the instant wins. They're looking for the quick results. It drives them down a very, very bad path where they maybe change their strategy too, too soon. They hop from a program far too prematurely. Uh, maybe they seek out calorie risk extreme calorie restrictive strategies. Maybe they go too gung-ho and extreme with the exercise because they're absolutely desperate to see that number on the scale plummet. And uh, yeah, in other words, it can take, a it can take us down a bad path or worse yet, you're throwing the towel altogether. You're throwing the towel altogether because you think you're not losing weight. And this is what so many people sadly do. And they think, you know what? I'm not seeing the results. I've lost a bit of weight, but it's not that much. It's really hard work. Let's go and have the chocolate cake anyway. Why not? What's it all for? Okay. So yeah, definitely worth deploying some patience. So let's turn our attention to exercise briefly here, which earlier on I said is a background factor, but it still can make a difference in terms of these fine margins that, that can create weight loss sometimes. It still can indeed make a difference. Now, if you're not doing any exercise right now, my message is very simple indeed. Do some, okay? If you're not moving your body right now, that, and I'm very aware that many of you watching this, this will be the case for you. If you're not moving your body right now and you drive to work and you drive everywhere and you don't have any activity during your weekly schedule that is particularly laborious from a physicality perspective, listen, do some exercise. Just go out and do some. Whether it's a 10-minute walk around the block a few times a week, maybe you jump in the, in the pool, your local pool, do some swimming twice a week, even if it's just 20 minutes. Do some if you're not doing any right now. In time, we can fine-tune things. You, work, you can work on form, technique. You can up the intensity, up the frequency in time as you become more advanced. If you're not doing any right now, just do some. I implore you. Not only is it great from a weight loss perspective, but also, and I would argue more importantly, from a well-being perspective. It's amazing in terms of vitality. It's amazing in terms of energy. A lot of people think they'll get more tired if they do more exercise, which can, of course, happen. But it's amazing what it does to your energy to have a little bit of exercise in your daily routine. Just a little bit can really help with energy levels, I find. Uh, it's also something that I find to be very, very therapeutic, a great stress reliever. So from a mental standpoint, it's something that has great benefits too. So do some exercise all in all. Um, cardio is wonderful. Cardio is brilliant for calorie burn. So objectively, um, objectively speaking, cardio for weight loss, wonderful in terms of the calories it can burn. Resistance training can also be great. It can also be a decent burner when it comes to calories. So it can be good for weight loss. But at the same time, it, and this depends on the intensity and the impact, but at the same time, cardio does win on that front in terms of calorie burn. Um, but where resistance training is wonderful is in terms particularly of the maintenance and growth of muscle mass. So if you have ambitions to also have quite a toned physique as well as just lose weight, maybe you're doing some strength training in the gym, uh, maybe you have ambitions at least to have a little bit of muscle as well and tone up in several areas. Well, then resistance training should be a, should be a part of your, your fitness regime as well, I would suggest, not just cardio. Cardio, again, can be decent with muscle maintenance, but if you're incorporating some resistance training in there, while slimming down, you are going to maintain a little bit more muscle. Now, what's important to note here, because a lot of people, they just think they can target fat loss rather than weight loss. 
But when you lose weight, when you slim down, you are inevitably going to lose some muscle with it. That is just a fact. You can't just isolate the fat and just target that. You are going. Now, there are steps you can take. There are steps that you can take to minimize the amount of uh, muscle that you're burning. And one of them would be to incorporate some resistance training with a cardio based routine. So I hope I've explained that well. So they've both got benefits, um, but really depends on what your goals are and also what you prefer to do as well. Uh, running, swimming and cycling are by far the best in terms of calorie burn. Now again, as I've hinted at, this depends on the intensity, it depends on the impact. So if you're doing a very light jog, it's not going to be anywhere near as good as, for instance, a high intensity, even sometimes a high intensity weight training session could actually burn more calories than a very low intensity run, if that makes sense, a very light jog. I hope I've explained that well. So yeah, it really does depend on the intensity, but generally speaking, running, swimming, cycling, incredible for weight loss, incredible in terms of the calorie burn. But again, that does depend on intensity and impact. So that's exercise. Now we need a decent way, and I hinted at this earlier, to monitor our progress as we go here. So we can be objective about our results. We can know if we're moving towards our goals or not. We can feel really great by doing that as well. You know, measuring our progress, feeling fulfilled along the way. And also here, by monitoring our progress, we can see when it's perhaps time to adjust our strategy, to change something a little bit, to do a little bit of troubleshooting. So this is really, really key. So one thing you can you can do in terms of the weight loss is before and after photos. You can take a photo, excuse me, on day one of the challenge, uh, maybe one on day 14, then one on day 30, day 15, day 30, and so on. So you can periodically take those. Now this is difficult because we've got different lighting conditions, whether you do it at what sort of time of day you do it, maybe you do it in a different mirror, different camera, and so on. So try and find uh, a place in your por apartment, let's say, where the parameters don't change, if that makes sense, um, which can sound a bit strange, but so you're basically, so you're in control of your environment, I suppose is what I'm trying to say by parameters. So you set a framework for when you're gonna take these photos, what sort of lighting, with which camera, and therefore you create that consistency. It's just a bit more accurate than taking one photo with your iPhone, doing a selfie with your iPhone, and then doing one like a, a standaway photo with your Canon. It's going to be very hard to make out the differences. You might think you're regressing in terms of your progress. You might actually think you're progressing more than you actually are. Um, and because using different things and having different parameters, having a different environment for taking photos, using different tools to take those photos can really throw things off and distort things. Okay. So that's important with before and after photos. Now, best of all, and again, this is something I mentioned earlier, weighing yourself is the best way to do things. There are lots of ways to monitor your weight loss progress. Again, one of them is before and after photos. Another one is taking circumference measurements. Another one is feedback from others. These are all hit and miss, I think, compared to weighing yourself. I think weighing yourself does have lots of downsides. There are these natural fluctuations. You need to have a good strategy for weighing yourself as well. You can't just do it sporadically, and I'll talk about that briefly here in a second. In other words, it's not perfect, but it's probably the best system we have for monitoring weight loss progress, I would say. So weigh yourself, and here's a way I would like you to do it. Doing it every day can be excessive because the changes are going to be so small and because stepping on the scales every day can be a bit of a painful pro, uh, a process for people uh, mentally. It can be uh, a bit disheartening for people. Uh, they start to perhaps more and more you jump on the scales with many, many people, the more and more they become uh, conscious in a negative sense of their weight issues, the more they worry about what the scale is going to say. It can be very, very, um, very, very mentally torturous to say the least to constantly be jumping on the scales. So I think a nice balance is every second day or alternatively you could do it maybe three days a week. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, but every second day or Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Friday. So it balances out a couple of times a week uh, in these fairly even, at least intervals. Probably a smart thing to do and write that down, right? A lot of people, they just plant the weight in their mind and they think, oh, what was I? Was I 73.1? Oh, okay, it's got, you, you got to write it down, write it down. Big tip as well. Because we're doing a 30 day challenge here, because the change isn't going to be huge, to see if we're moving in the right direction, we want the number on the scale to be as specific as possible. So try if you can and measure in pounds, that's probably better than kilos or stones, and try and get a scale. If you don't have a scale right now and you go out to buy one for this challenge, good move by the way, I like the commitment. Try and find one that goes to like at least one or two decimal points. Um, they don't round up or anything like that. You want them to go to one or two decimal points. So you actually have that accuracy and reliability there when you make these conclusions and assessments after jumping on the scale. You might be changing your strategy based on a really poor weigh-in if you don't do this, like one that's based on kilos, one that maybe rounds up for instance, doesn't go to decimal points. You might think you're not losing weight, 
up here, up, uh, you know, up, upend, excuse me, a great deal of your strategy very prematurely uh, and, and completely erroneously. So that's a big point as well. So weigh yourself every second day. Big tip as well, weigh yourself at the same time every day, right? A lot of people, they'll weigh in at 6 p.m. one day, then they'll, it'll be the next time they go to the gym, so it might be 4 p.m. on a Saturday, then they jump on the scale they've got in their bathroom at 5 a.m. one morning. And it's all over the shop because at those different points in the day, we've got food in our system, or we might not have food in our system, different clothes on, and we might be talking about very fine margins here but again these are the things that can throw us off and give us a false reading lead us to making a change or getting really disheartened perhaps prematurely in many cases so yeah try and weigh in at the same time every day i would suggest it's best to do it in the morning without clothes after you've been to the bathroom before you've eaten any food before you drank a sip of water again sounds very specific sounds hardcore but that's the way you're going to get the most accurate measure now it's still going to be difficult because because the scales are a nightmare there are these natural fluctuations uh, women's time of the month uh, sodium retention water retention these are common examples of why people's weight fluctuates but that doesn't necessarily mean that your weight loss progress isn't thriving that's an important point to know so scales are great but not the best uh, excuse me scales are the best but on you know <laughs> There, there, uh, there are some weaknesses there. There are some vulnerabilities, in other words. So don't get too disheartened by them, that's for sure. We want to make sure we're on the downward trend and not microanalyzing every way in, okay? Blood work is another good one. So this is strictly from a health perspective here, but you could get your health markers checked, your blood work, your cholesterol, and so on. Do it on day one or before day one of the challenge, then do it at the end. Great way of monitoring your progress from a health standpoint. And finally, some troubleshooting tips here to wrap up. So I spoke about fat content towards the start of this video, right at the top here. Listen, you can lower your fat content, cut back a little bit on the avocados, the nuts and the seeds. Again, we want these from a health standpoint. They have some wonderful properties in them, some wonderful vitamins and minerals and whatnot that you can get from these, the fatty acids, the, these omegas that you can't get elsewhere on a plant-based diet. So we do need these, but cutting back on them, um, maybe even temporarily, could allow you, uh, could allow what you need really to get through that plateau you're struggling with right now. Uh, number two, you could look at your calorie intake. I've already given you the resources to do that, but you could look at your overall calorie intake focus more on the whole foods I mentioned earlier on when I spoke in depth on processed foods you could change your ratio in terms of the process to whole food amounts there that's one thing you could do and finally what's your consistency like are you follow it during this 30 days here are you staying on track for five days and then having a vegan burger some Oreo cookies or some vegan Ben and Jerry's ice cream at the weekend and self-justifying because it's still vegan it doesn't have the dairy so it might be okay it's not that bad well these things, they're still heavily processed, they're still refined. Yeah, comparatively, obviously you don't have the ethical ramifications of eating something that isn't vegan. And yes, maybe comparatively it's got lower saturated fat and whatnot, maybe it's lower in calories, but these still aren't optimal from a health and weight loss point of view. So what's your consistency like? Just by being more consistent, by eliminating the alcohol on the weekends, by eliminating that meal out from time to time, you can actually take your results up to a new level. So that's important to know. So as I said here, to wrap up, these notes are going to be saved over at naturalweightlossmastery.com in the blog section. Hope you found this video really useful. I know this is a lot of information and I started out by saying, listen, I don't want to confuse you. I want to make this simple. And I do think I've given you some, some clear, actionable soundbite steps here to get started with that I do think are simple and basic. But at the same time, this is still a lot of information, so digest it. Uh, you don't need to worry about it all at once, as I say, uh, but keep reading through this. Uh, hopefully you've taken your own notes as well. Uh, some of this you'll have down already, some of this you'll know about, some of this will be new to you. So hopefully I've not thrown too much of you, uh, too much of this at you all in one session, in other words. I thank you for your time today. Again, hope you found this really valuable. If you did indeed, smash that like button. Subscribe if you're just running into me for the first time. I'll catch you in the next video. All the best.